Okay, welcome to um, a deep dive into sex positivity with Dr. Kit Stubbs. Um, Dr. Kit Stubbs is a transgender, non-binary queer maker and entrepreneur who earned their PhD in robotics from Carnegie Mellon University and went on to create okay, the- Okay, welcome to- Effing Foundation, um, Hold A on. deep dive Oops. into sex positivity. Went on to create the Effing Foundation for Sex Positivity, a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to normalize conversations about sex. Since 2017, the Effing Foundation has awarded over 170,000 in grants to sex positive artists and educators across the US. And this seminar is sponsored by Women of Reform of uh, Rodef Shalom. And we have um, Dr. Stubbs first seminar on the Rodef Shalom Congregation uh, YouTube page. If you're interested in going back and looking at that also, it was fabulous. And we also do a lot of other um, great programs and social action, um, which you can also see from um, the Rodef Shalom Congregation YouTube page. So, Dr. Kit Stubbs, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Um, Elaine, if you can enable me to share my screen so I can get the slides up, that would be great. Hmm. Yeah, sorry, I'm still getting host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, sorry, I did not share. Do you need you need to share the screen? Hold yeah. on. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Awesome. So let's pull up the slides. Okay. Yay, so thank you all again for coming to a deep dive into sex positivity. So um, we've got a lot of material to cover. I'm really excited y'all are here. Um, you're welcome to take notes if you like, but I have also put the slides up now. They're on my website at toymakerproject.com. Um, so the slides are there and there's also links to some of the materials that I'm gonna be talking about and other good reference materials. So all that is up for you at toymakerproject.com. Yay. So yeah, hi, I'm Kit. Um, I am a non-binary transgender person, um, which basically, basically all that says is if your system of gender only has two options, my gender is no. <laughs> my gender is not that. Um, I identify as trans since I was, I, I was a girl and a woman and now I am not anymore. So I have my my current gender and my gender assigned at birth do not align so i'm transgender um i'm queer more specifically i identify as pansexual which ba is basically saying i am potentially attracted to adult humans um and i use they them and theirs pronouns um as elaine mentioned so uh, i got my phd in robotics at carnegie mellon and i ended up instead getting into sex positivity activism i founded the effing foundation and we basically make grants to artists and educators who are doing sex positive work so in this talk we've got a little bit of an introduction and then we're going to take a look at what sex positivity is briefly and then we're going to look at a whole host of things um, issues that if we're, if we want to follow a sex positive framework, what do, you know, what, how does that inform what we believe about things like sex ed and reproductive justice? Um, you know, so I do want to give a content warning. This is actually the first content warning I've ever needed to give for a talk, uh, cause the subject matter is often well known. Um, but I do want to say that we're going to be discussing some specific examples around cis heterosexism, ableism, anti-fat bias, racism, and sex work. So this can be very intense content. It was intense for me writing some of it. Um, so if at any point you need to step away, put me on mute, like whatever you need to do to take care of yourself, please do that. Um, yeah. So I kind of ordered these 
at least in my journey for things that were sort of less challenging, if I accepted sex positivity, there's some issues that were less challenging for me to think about. And then there were issues that were more challenging for me to think about um, kind of in my own journey. So that's kind of how I structured this. Um, and in particular, for each of these topics, we're going to be looking at our own internal biases and how they affect the issue. And we're gonna be looking at sort of bigger systems of oppression and what, what can be going on. So that's, that's kind of the general plan. We'll be stopping pretty much after every topic um, to see if you have any questions, clarifications. Um, we should have plenty of time for that. Um, but yeah, thank you again so much for joining me. This is, um, it's a lot of material, but it's, it's really awesome to me that you all are, are interested in this issue and you're interested in learning more. Um, that, that really speaks very highly of, of each of you. And I am so thankful to have the opportunity to work with you. So before we get started, I'd like to do a quick privilege check and land acknowledgement, just recognizing I have a lot of privilege in being white well-educated. Um, I can use the name on my driver's license for this kind of work in, in activism. Not everybody can. Um, I also like to do a quick land acknowledgement. So I'm in Somerville, Massachusetts, outside of Boston. Um, that is unceded land from the Massachusetts and Pawtucket tribes. Out in Pittsburgh, um, you're on the land of the Osage and Shawnee peoples, as well as some other tribes. Um, but yeah, just like to be mindful of that. Ah, yes, my disclaimers. If you were at my last talk, these may seem familiar because they're, they're still true. First of all, I am not that kind of doctor. <laughs> we are talking about sex and sexuality and gender. I am not a physician. Um, I will also say you are the ultimate authority on your own gender, body, and pleasure. Um, you know what's best for you. Take away from this talk what you can use. Um, mine is just one perspective. I'm going to be speaking on a number of identity issues, some of these identities I share and some of them I don't. Um, and so, you know, I'm happy to share what I can and what I've learned. But again, I'm just one voice and I hope you will consider um, looking and listening to other folks in this community as well. Um, the values that are going to inform my approach here and you'll, this will be particularly relevant later in the talk. I believe people when they tell me who they are and what their experience is, what their name is, what their pronoun is. Um, I try to treat people the way they want to be treated. Um, yeah. So well, like I say, we'll see what <laughs> this will come up as we go through the talk. So what is sex positivity? A very brief refresher. So Dr. Carol Queen is a fabulous sexologist, um, I believe based in San Francisco, and she popularized the term. So she says sex positivity refers to a radical stance, accepting everyone's sexual desires and choices, providing they're consensually engaged in. Like that's really it. Um, so at its face, it sounds very much about sort of sex and acts and who is doing them and are people consenting. But there's also just generally a foundation of the value of bodily autonomy that by accepting a sex, a sex positivity lens, we are celebrating people's bodily autonomy. We want pre to preserve people's right to choose what they do with their bodies. Um, and the issue of consent is super important. Um, so, I feel like it kind of goes without saying, but yeah, like these are, so, so, you know, looking at consent, folks, folks excitedly, ideally agreeing to some activities they're going to participate in together. Right. And so these, the, these principles of sort of bodily autonomy and consent, we're going to see again and again, as we look at different topics through uh, kind of diving into sex positivity. The first thing we are going to talk about is sex ed. So if we value bodily autonomy and consent, what kind of sexual education do we want to see in the world? And what I and the Effing Foundation argue is that what we want to see is comprehensive sex education. What does that mean? Basically, it means we want to see sex ed that is scientifically accurate, that is based in that is based in science and how things actually work in the real world. Um, we want sex ed that is queer and trans inclusive because queer and trans youth exist and queer and trans people exist. This is also um, supported by scientific study. And we want everyone really to, to live in a world where we have an understanding of gender and sexual orientation that extends to queer and trans people, that, that queer and trans people are just a normal thing because we are just doing our normal selves here out in the world. 
we want our sex education to be pleasure based. So the sex education that I received growing up in Missouri was pretty much just the reproductive system. Here's the male reproductive system. He's the female reproductive system. And yeah, guys get boners sometimes. Like it was not really helpful. Um, and while it is important to understand reproduction, absolutely. Um, by recognizing that sex is largely something that people do for fun, we are able to give people better, better t tools and better skills for making the decisions about what's right for them. Um, we obviously support age appropriate sex ed, right? And you, the thing about age appropriate sex ed, you can start having conversations with kids about boundaries and like respecting when people say no. You can do that when kids are fairly young. Um, you know, if you ask somebody for a hug and they say no, like that is a thing that is normal and okay and we can accept this and we should respect this answer. Um, so you can start fairly young talking about talking about things in that way until kids get older and you're going to start talking more about genitals and STIs and like all the other magical things <laughs> that we have to consider. But those are some of the big things we're looking at in terms of sex ed. Um, the best example I can give for a sex ed curriculum is the Our Whole Lives curriculum. Um, it was developed in conjunction uh, by the Unitarian Universalist Association and the United Church of Tri Christ. It is a secular curricula, but this is so cool. They have not one, but seven curricula based on the age of the people that you're working with. So you can start really young with K kindergarten and first graders all the way through grade school, high school. Then they have a young adult, adult, and an older adult curriculum. Um, it's super cool. Again, highly recommend. They have an additional module around sort of spirituality and sexuality in particular, but these these this particular curriculum is not uh, is not religiously focused. But what it does is it covers all these topics that people are talking about gender and sexuality. They're talking about relationships and how we have relationships with each other. Um, in addition to you know body parts and mechanics and how you keep yourself safe and things like that. Super cool. Um, and so when we look at like pushing for comprehensive sex education, what are we fighting? Um, what, what are we struggling with in terms of internal biases and systems of oppression? And really, I think for both of these, we're fighting against so cis heterosexism, which we're going to talk in more depth later. But that's basically the idea that we're oppressing queer and trans folks. It's kind of the assumption that being cisgender, so your gender now matches your gender on your birth certificate and heterosexual, that that is sort of the normal way to be and anything else is gross, weird, or bad. Um, we're fighting that, obviously. We're fighting a shame culture, right? Unfortunately, um, in large part due to the influence of, say, the Puritans, for example, um, we have a lot of shame in our culture. As, as obsessed as we are about sex, we see we also have a lot of shame in having honest and open discussions about sex and sexuality. And that's that's something we have to fight against, ageism. So here, the it both comes from hey, not like do we respect our young people enough to give them good information so they can make good decisions, like or not? Um, do we make sure that our older folks, folks, senior citizens, folks in nursing homes uh, and care centers, are they given? the knowledge and the tools that they need. Over the last number of years, we have seen a real uptick in sexually transmitted infections in seniors, like senior centers and senior communities. Um, like everybody deserves good sex ed and good tools to help them take care of themselves and their partners and make good decisions. So, okay, we've just started rolling. Quick question break. So if you want to ask a question, um, I'm going to make sure that I can actually get y'all's chat because I've got to find the Zoom window for chat. I don't know where it went. Anyway, I may or may not be able to see you if you raise your hand, but if you go to tinyurl.com forward slash kit, K-I-T-W-O-R-S for Women of Road of Shalom, um, you'll find a form there and you can ask me a question. We'll, like I say, we'll be taking breaks throughout. Feel free to ask a question and I will get to it as soon as I can. Elaine, you'll have to keep me honest if I can't see, because <laughs> right now, for whatever reason, Zoom is only giving me my window and like a tiny window of videos, but I don't have the chat window, so I can't like see if people are raising their hands. Um, so again, yeah, uh, thanks for your patience on that. Um, but yeah, did anybody have anything just jumping off about what sex positivity is, general questions about gender or sexuality you'd like cleared up before we move on? Um, I, I just have a, 
a brief question, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, awesome. great. Um, so I had asked in the chat window um, what you think about the start of a trend of parents who are asking their babies um, for their consent to change their diaper as a means to make them aware of their bodily autonomy from the start. Not like they're not going. Oh, you dropped out. Oh, no. Um, yeah, sorry, Jocelyn, I think we lost you there for a second. But so at least I heard the beginning of that, right? So this idea that parents are actually kind of asking, asking children when they're going to do something. Um, I have heard a little bit about that. I don't know a ton about that. I'm like, generally, I'm in favor of sort of illustrating that we recognize that even really young kids get to have boundaries. Now, in the case of an infant or it's hot, like there's going to be like, you're going to have to change the diapers. They're going to have to put on clothes. You know, you're going to have to take them to the doctor. Like there's things that you can't avoid, mm -hmm. but as much as you can, like let it like kind of bringing this kind of up, letting them know that there are options. You know, if a kid, you know, you may ask, you've got your kid and it's like, hey, can you give aunt so-and-so a hug? And if the kid says no, be like, oh, okay, have maybe a high five, you know, like that's one of the things is that it starts very young, the idea that kids don't actually get to have bodily autonomy. Um, and so, yeah, like, I, I don't know how to say about a thing that like you kind of were already going to do. <laughs> Um, in the case of like a diaper change, but you know, I think as much as possible, especially where there are, where there is an option, like, yeah, I, I, that seems very reasonable to me. Cool. Thank you. That was a cool question, man. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know where the chat window is. <laughs> I don't know where it is. So thank you. All right. Well, cool. Well, let's keep rolling and, and more questions can kind of percolate as we go. Reproductive justice. Are, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the concept of reproductive justice. I really only learned about it a few years ago as I was getting into sex positivity. So the term reproductive justice was coined in 1994 by a group of black women who had gathered in Chicago. They were on their way to the International Conference on Population Development in Cairo. And basically this group got together and what they were talking about is the fact that, that women's rights at the time tended to mostly mean the rights of middle-class and wealthy white women. That, that the women's rights movement as a whole was not doing a great job defending the needs of women of color, other marginalized women, or trans people. And so in 1997, a number of these women went on to found Sister Song. So Sister Song is like the first sort of multiracial sort of national coalition formed in support of reproductive justice. Um, they are super cool, sistersong.org. I highly recommend like everything they do. They're really cool. And so how do they, so they define reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. So it's the whole picture, not just of, are you getting access to abortion? Are you getting access to contraception? But are you having the children you want to have, not having the children you don't want to have, and in general, having a safe environment where you can really raise those children? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really, really cool movement. And again, you see this, this foundation of bodily autonomy and consent. So for me, as a sex positivity activist, this means I'm also invested in supporting reproductive justice work. So what, what does that look like? So, so Sister Song talks about, one of the things I say is no access is no choice. So while we talk a lot, there's you know, the ongoing dialogue about choice. Do people have choice? Can they make the choice to say have an abortion or to get contraception? What Sister Song argues is if, is if there is no access, if your only healthcare provider for an abortion or for contraception is 200 miles away and you can't afford to take time off work to go there, it is not accessible to you. It is not really a choice at that point. And so there's a lot of work on Sister Song that takes place in the South in particular around how do we make sure that while, that, that not only the people have the choice, but that they actually have access to make it a real, to make it a meaningful choice, that it is actually 
uh, available. Um, they're not just interested in abortion rights, although that is very important. They're also pushing for you know, access to contraception, access to good comprehensive sex ed, STI testing, prenatal care. So those are the things we kind of expect when we think about sort of reproduction and people being able to make their own choices. But more broadly, they're also fighting for living wages, um, for safe homes, right? The idea is you want every parent to have to, you know, to be making a, a wage that's good enough that they can support their family. They're in a safe environment. Um, you know, they're free from police violence, for instance. And so it's really a broader picture than just access around sort of the reproductive system alone. Um, and again, they're particularly doing work center centering women of color, um, poorer women, um, and trans people. So when we look at reproductive justice, again, looking at our biases and our systems of oppression, we're really fighting a lot against white supremacy here. So we live in a, unfortunately, we live in a white supremacist system that does not respect and hold val and value the lives of people of color as much as it is white people. Um, we're dealing with a lot of anti-immigrant bias, potentially. Again, who, who is reproducing? Who is having children? Are there certain people who shouldn't be doing those things? Um, something we have to fight. Again, cis-heterosexism, fighting for the rights of queer and trans folk, which we'll get into momentarily. So, okay, we've done another chunk. We've taken a look at reproductive justice. How are folks doing? Questions? I'd like to add that another um, another thing that we're fighting is um, misogyny. Yep, absolutely. Yep, that women women are not trusted to be the experts on their own bodies. Women are not respected to make decisions. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Elaine. I should, I should add that to that slide. I will add that to that slide. Uh, can I can I say something? Yeah. Hi, um, so Kit, I was at the conference at Smith where Sister Song, where the reproductive justice framework was developed for the Planned Parenthood. Um, That's workers, awesome. And, and worked with Loretta Ross on this. And actually yeah. one of the big issues in that was it was really that moment in time when um, children were starting to become available for adoption for same-sex couples. So there was this abrogation of parental rights um, as, as le especially lesbian families began to push to become parents that meant that kids that were in vulnerable positions, maybe a mom couldn't pay for rent or something or couldn't pay for heat. And so that kid was more quickly moved into being available for adoption. Um, so there's this interesting tension between the right to parent and who gets the right to parent and the way in which children in the foster care system and in the adopt in the um, system were sort of also being kind of moved through that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. My, my understanding is that children are removed from their parents when their parents are parent, uh, people of color at a much higher rate than with white parents. Well, they were moving, they were moving the time period quickly more mm -hmm. quickly they were speeding it up yeah um, oh my gosh yeah exactly oh thank you yeah so again that's another that is that is a very interesting tension cool anyone else want to jump in all right well let's keep rolling so now we start to get into to some of the isms right so if we're if we're ostensibly sex positive where like where does that put us in terms of cis heterosexism so so what is cis heterosexism so again just to reiterate it's this kind of belief or assumption that being cisgender so your gender now matches your gender on your birth certificate and being heterosexual so if you're a man attracted only to women if you're a woman attracted only to men that that is sort of that is sort of the only normal natural state of humans um you can also Cis heterosexism is also the term we use for basically oppressing people who are not cisgender and uh, or heterosexual. So here's here's my example. This is a Lego set that I just bought in June. I haven't bought a Lego set in a very long time. 
Um, but they had this pride some come out and it's super cool because not only does it have the rainbow, it has the black stripe for victims of HIV AIDS. It has the brown stripe for black and brown people, people of color, and it has the blue, white and pink stripes from the trans pride flag. I was super excited. I, I like pre, I like ordered this on June 1st, as soon as it was available. So I've loved Lego since I was a kid and rainbow capitalism is another thing to be mindful of, but I was like, I love Lego. What can I say? So I got this set. And the set is called Everyone is Awesome, which is adorable. If you haven't seen the Lego movie, I do recommend. I enjoyed. Um, but here's, here's what's interesting. On the box for my Lego set, it is rated 18 and up. Hmm. Well, basically what that is saying is that queer and trans people are abnormal and should not be seen by children. Like that is what that is saying, right? Um, 18 up, oh, adults only. Um, so if queer and trans people should not be seen by children, it really means that queer and trans people do not belong in public. Like that's when you drill down, that's what that says. Um, and it also is saying queer and trans youth don't exist, which is false. <laughs> queer and trans youth absolutely do exist. And so this is what cis heterosexism is like. It's we live in this world where queer and trans people, the, the, the dominating force is for queer and trans people to be, to not exist, basically, to be invisible. Um, and as a queer and trans person, I can tell you that sucks. Um, and some of you may relate to this as well. It is awful. Um, because in, and in particular, if you, we have this sort of cis heterosexist culture that we live in, combine that with a lack of reasonable education about say gender and sexuality, um, there is a disproportionate rate of violence against LGBTQ plus people. Um, so in terms of the overall population, LGBTQ plus people make up about 5.6%, give or take. In 2019, 18.8% of the single bias hate crimes were motivated by LGBTQ plus status. So if everything was, was balanced, we would expect that queer people would be targeted about 5.6% of the time because they're about 5.6% of the population if attacks were kind of random. Um, but no, the rate is almost 20%. So it's, it's, more, it's between three and four times more um, than it should be. And like, that's, that's kind of why, that's why this matters. Um, and in particular, if folks aren't aware, I wanted to mention briefly the panic defense. This is basically, so you've got someone who's been accused of a hate crime against a queer trans person. And as part of the defense, it's not usually the only defense, but as part of the defense, you're basically arguing that, well, when the accused person, the person who did some harm, uh, allegedly did some harm, found out that the victim was queer or trans, they basically, that that was just sort of overwhelming and they freaked out and so they attacked this person and so the violence was kind of justified. Um, dozens of murders have been acquitted using the panic defense. Um, it's awful. And it is only banned in 15 states in the District of Columbia. It is not banned in Pennsylvania, in case you would like to know. Um, yeah, like this is the system that, that we are living under. And certainly people, we are fighting this, but like this is the system we are under. And so I ask y'all to just take a moment and consider, right? How would you, and you, some of you may have already been in these situations. And I, I acknowledge that. Um, you know, how would you feel if someone close to you was dating a transgender person? I don't know, maybe a dear friend of yours or a child of yours or, you know, someone, someone you're close to your community. Like, how would you feel if you found out that someone you really cared about was dating a transgender person? Maybe would you have feels? Maybe you would not have feels. Um, how would you feel if someone close to you came out to you as queer? Um, that's a big thing. Um, that can that can be a really difficult that can be a really difficult thing to happen. Um, or how would you feel if someone close to you came out to you as transgender? That can also be a really difficult conversation with really difficult feelings. Um, because again, and it's it's. And it's understandable to have a first reaction that is very challenging, again, because we live in a culture where this is the norm. I want to I want to recognize that, um, you know, I can ask, would you date a transgender person um, if you are 
if you are currently dating, like, would you date a transgender person? Um, that's a fair question. Some people uh, say they prefer not to, right? Because if, again, if we're moving back to bodily autonomy and consent, you absolutely get to have your individual boundaries and preferences about who you want to date, um, who you want to spend your time with. Um, and all basically all that I ask is that you consider, you know, are there ways in which the cis, the cis heterosexist culture that we live in may have influenced the boundaries and preferences that you have? And this is a thing we're going to see kind of again and again as we look at different issues surrounding sex positivity that you get to have, we all get to have our individual boundaries and preferences, but it is a good idea to be mindful of what may be influencing those. So when we're looking at cis heterosexism in particular, talking about internal biases, we can think about dating preferences. Um, you know, maybe you're a straight person who doesn't want to date bi people, or you're uh, a queer, a, a cisgender queer person who doesn't want to date trans people. Like that, that may be worth some investigation. Um, education, just in general, sort of what do you know about gender and sexuality? Um, are, you, are you helping to educate others? Um, in your circles. And then, you know, we're in the frame of larger systems of oppression. So things like having a justice system where in many states you can use this panic defense if you've been accused of violence against a queer or trans person. There are also a number of anti-transgender bills up in legislation in the states right now. Um, things from youth sports to access to restrooms and locker rooms and public facilities. Like these are all issues where right now we're, we are experiencing a lot of pushback and that can be very challenging. Okay, <laughs> we've done another chunk. Do folks have questions or thoughts they would like to share at this time? Mm. Laura, yes. Oh no, yes, you're muted, there we go. Can I just um, contextualize the 18? And I do this, I'm a history professor who was at UMass for 20 years and has just moved to Pitt. Um, oh, cool. And I taught what was the first entry-level history of sex course that I developed because I had high school teachers in, in Massachusetts who told me that if students asked them questions, they could get fired if they answered the questions because Massachusetts has a law that says that parents have to be informed if anyone is going to talk about sex. And in fact, they have the right to opt out of it. So it's actually, even in one of the most progressive state, what we think of as a progressive state, right? The rule is that you may not talk about sex without prior parental permission. Um, and mm -hmm. so one of the context issues is really the way in which this push around sex education, even as we're pushing consent, right? The, the legislation at the state level that silences any kind of discussion around sex education has just had this profound effect on um, places and even, even teachers, even teachers in states that turn down, right? Some of this goes back to the Reagan administration, even states where people turned it down, a lot of times teachers will silence themselves out of fear mm -hmm. of, of, you know, evoking something. So even if a state has not uh, agreed to the, um, you know, not, I keep saying, just saying, it's not just saying no, it's whatever the, the sex ed piece was under Reagan. Um, and so, so there is that kind of silencing issue. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, awesome. I really appreciate that perspective. Yeah, exactly. And so you get into this state where, yeah, again, like, do we need, like, how do we get, you know, getting parental consent and yeah, being, being afraid to, to share, even if it's not strictly required. Yeah. Cause we're, we're very much in this environment that like, set, like there's, that like sex and students just don't mix, despite the fact that there is good curricula and like, there are ways to do it. It's so, I mean, like I basically, when I started doing this work, I was like, I will never work in a K-12 school again. Like having done this work publicly. I know I won't. And that like, I was, I was in robotics education. So I was doing stuff with like kids and robotics competitions. And like, that was a part of my work. And when I, when I made this career shift, part of it was like acknowledging like, nope, I won't, I won't be able to go back into K-12. And like well, UMass Amherst made me get a signature from parents 
from any college student who was under 18 that they could take a course on the history of, of education, history of sex. Oh my Not, gosh. So, so it really has. So that's why Lego is using that piece is really kind of acknowledging kind of the silencing effect. Mm-hmm. Of these issues. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Anyone else have any other questions or, or thoughts to add? Um, uh, I, I submitted through the URL, but I don't know if you're not getting it. But oh, um, no. 5.6% is the number, the percentage of people who identify, not the percentage of people oh. who are. Oh, thank you. Yes, I should have so, clarified that. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Now, why aren't I getting that? Let me... Apologies, let me take a minute and (laughs) Oh, there we go. Okay, for whatever reason, it wasn't showing up where I expected, but I see it somewhere else. There we go. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the clarification. 5.6% is the of the percentage of people who responded that they are that, that they identified as but the not the percentage who actually are which is kind of an invisible number that because people may not self-report absolutely yes thank you rachel appreciate it cool all right at least so i do see i do see that in here now yay thank you awesome anything else i just wanted to i just wanted to put something out there which is kind of a little bit random but i just want to acknowledge that you know and I'm sure we all know this, but I just want to verbalize that, you know, there are so many small towns. There's a, a, a child I know in, in a small town who is the only person they are aware of who is um, transgender. Mm. And this person has been basically, um, it's it's been almost, it hasn't been verbalized, but it has been demonstrated that this person should not be allowed to exist as they are. And that has been perpetuated by adults in this person's life, family members in this person's life, their peers, and the amount of loneliness and shame and suffering that this person goes through and that's just happening too much yes all over the place and I just wanted to just acknowledge that oh thank you yeah absolutely queer queer and and trans youth have can have an incredibly difficult time especially yeah in smaller towns certain areas of the country um even in even in places where we we think of as more liberal like you can it is not easy it is not easy to be trans or queer um, in these places. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sending so many good wishes to that young trans person. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I'll see if I can pull it up later. There's there's a couple of organizations that are doing work for trans youth. And I'll have to, I'll have to see if I can pick that up later because it's coming to mind, but the the actual name has fallen out of my head, of course. So I'm hoping it'll come back later. But thank you, Jocelyn. I appreciate that as well. Cool. All right. Well, let's let's keep on rolling. All right. So now let's take a look at ableism. This is one of those things that when I started getting into sex positive activism, at first I didn't really think too much about. So what is ableism? Um, so Stacy Milburn is an awesome disability activist, and I link to a video on my website. So under the slides, you'll find this, this video called Ableism is the Bane of My Motherfucking Existence. And Stacy says that ableism is a system of oppression that favors being able-bodied or able-minded at any cost, frequently at the expense of people with disabilities. Um, we very much, unfortunately, live in a society that values um, the lives and autonomy of people we consider able-bodied at the expense of disabled folks. Um, And so when we think about sex positivity, when you think of what does it mean for someone to look sexy, right? Who is entitled to pleasure? If you think of sort of like stereotypical examples, like who, who is used to, you know, sell cars or perfume or booze, right? It's like white, thin, you know, able-bodied people. Um, 
you know, when we think about who, who looks sexy, do you think about someone who's using a wheelchair? Do you think about someone who's using a walker? Do you think about someone who has a guide dog? Um, at least for me, not at first glance. Um, and so, so when we think about sort of who gets to be sexy, disabled people do, do not generally make the first cut. And when we think about sort of who is entitled to pleasure, like again, disabled folks are not often necessarily gonna come to mind. There, we, we tend to have an kind of this assumption that disabled people are asexual. Asexual meaning they do not really experience sexual attraction and they are probably not having sex. This is kind of the, the default assumption our society tends to make when thinking about people with disabilities. Um, and in the pursuit of this talk, so, I, there is a there's a group called the DASA network, the Disability and Sexuality Access Network. Again, I link this I link this on my website. They have a list of sexuality professionals with various disabilities, and I can tell you, you know, people who use a wheelchair, who have a chronic illness, who are bi or quadriplegic, who are deaf or hard of hearing, who are blind or have limited vision, who may have a mental illness may have a developmental disability, people who are amputees, can and do have sex lives. Um, and again, this is just not something that we are encouraged to think about, um, but it's, it's absolutely true. Um, and again, these are issues of bodily autonomy and consent, right? If you have someone, and I'm not talking about, obviously you need to have someone, whatever condition or state they have, who can, you know, grasp kind of the, the idea of bodily autonomy and consent. Um, but there are people in all of these groups who can and do, and so they can have sex lives. And like, that is totally fine and totally normal. Again, it's, it's fine to be asexual. And so there are certainly also disabled folks who are asexual, just like there are non-disabled folks who are asexual. Um, but this kind of default assumption that nobody who's disabled is getting any is just not true. <laughs> it's just not. Um, and so when we're thinking about ableism and we're thinking about internal biases and systems of oppression, internal biases, that may come down, again, re-examining our dating preferences. Who are we interested in dating? Who do we think is, is not interesting or not available? Um, bigger systems of oppression. So unfortunately, for folks with disabilities, there is an even more severe lack of good sex education because, again, there's this this sort of assumption that folks with disabilities are asexual um, and not recognizing that they may have, they may have sexual desires and needs. Um, this can co be correlated with a lack of sexual health care, right? So if you are, if you are disabled, your doctor may not be thinking to check in like, hey, have you gotten STI tested recently? Hey, you know, how are you doing with contraceptives? Like, do you need any more condoms, right? Unfortunately, because we have these these biases, we end up with these kind of bias systems. Um, I also briefly want to issue, mention the issue of marriage inequality. So for folks who may not be aware, people who are on disability in the US, if they get married, either to another disabled person or to a non-disabled person, they basically lose all their benefits. Um, and so while we have made great strides in the marriage equality front for say gay and trans people, um, folks with disabilities don't have access to the same rights um, that a lot of able-bodied people take for granted. So I could say, again, like we had a lot of topics here. We could say a lot more, but we can pause now. Do folks have other questions or comments um, around sort of looking at ableism in these issues? No is an okay answer. That is fine. Oh, I heard a beep. I don't know if, did somebody raise a hand? I can't see that, unfortunately, still. Uh, maybe we're okay. Cool, cool. I'll check my, see if we have any more responses. Nope, we're doing okay. Cool. All right, good job, team. We will, we will keep on keeping on. So the next thing I wanted to take a look at is anti-fat bias. So what is this? So again, when we think about 
who looks sexy and who is entitled to pleasure, we're generally thinking about thin people, like just like right off the top, right? Who are, who are the most attractive people in the world? Like as people tend to rank, at least from the United States perspective, right? We tend to really put a lot of emphasis on thinness. Um, you know, who looks sexy? Not a lot of people would necessarily mention a fat or super fat person when they think of who looks sexy, who is entitled to pleasure. Um, whose bodies are we entitled to police? Um, I mentioned this because basically anti-fat bias is, has been called like one of the last acceptable prejudices. Um, fat folks, you know, fat jokes, you, you, you know, it is a very poor idea for a comedian to make a racist joke. Um, but generally it is okay to make fat jokes. That's just fine. Um, in movies, actors are put into fat suits instead of casting actual fat people um, for roles where characters are fat. Um, fat people often have to pay more for clothing if they can even find clothing in their size in shops. Um, a lot of fat people are forced to shop online because larger, like, larger sizes like 3X and up just aren't available in stores. Um, I actually, as I was doing the research for this talk, found out that weight discrimination, at least as of a couple years ago, is legal everywhere but Michigan. Like it is okay to discriminate against someone for a job, for housing, for whatever, because they're fat. Um, BMI, the body mass index, is actually, it has a racist origin and it is medically contested. So BMI is a measure that is, it is commonly used to say whether an individual is overweight or not. And it was actually originally developed by a guy who was A, interested in using it across whole populations, not individuals, but also because of this kind of eugenicist, like let's let's show that the white folks are, are better than people of color. Um, so I linked to an article specifically on the history of BMI on my website. Um, many, and just to recognize that that science studies have shown that many causes of obesity are actually beyond a person's control. We now know, you know, there are, there can be genetic influences, other influences, and a person just does not have any control. Like we generally tend to envision weight as like a willpower issue. Um, and that's really not fair um, and not accurate. Um, additionally, to point out, a lot of prescription medications are not adequately tested on larger bodies. So uh, people, fat folks can have much more difficulty getting medications that work because, you know, the FDA doesn't require that companies test them on larger bodies. So doctors may not know, you know, may not have in good dosage, dosing information, for instance, um, all the kinds of things that fat people in our culture have to deal with. Um, I would argue that regardless of health, like regardless of whether or not we think a fat person is healthy, I believe that no one deserves to be treated less than just because they are fat. Um, I just, I don't, I just don't. Uh, I would argue that regardless of size, everyone is entitled to enjoy their own bodies, right? These are, I, I think it's just important to make sure that that is said. Um, it does not matter what size you are, if you would like to enjoy your own body uh, or consenting partners' bodies in a sexual way, that is fine. And so if you want to start changing your own views on fatness and beauty, I highly recommend you check out the Adipositivity Project. So. The Adipositivity Project is a, a grantee of the Effing Foundation. We have made two awards to Substantia Jones. She is um, a photographer who is exhibited around the globe, and she takes nude portraits of fat and super fat people um, and their partners, a uh, variety of races, gender, sexual orientations, all kinds of people all over the world, just being, and it's amazing because so many of the photos show so much joy. Um, of fat people just loving themselves, loving their bodies, loving their partners. It's super cool. Um, these are just a few of the folk, uh, a couple of the photos that I picture that I picked up um, from adipositivity.com um, that show this. And it's, it's really cool. And I at least have found that once I started becoming more aware of anti-fat bias, once I started looking at some of Substantia's images and other sort of positive representation of fat folks. Like it really, at least for me, it started to change sort of what I saw as beautiful. Um, 
and it, you know, and it, it certainly has been a, you know, I'm still a thing, obviously I'm dealing with because the work, the work is kind of, the work is never done, but I feel that Substantia is doing awesome work to show the beauty of fat and super fat people and their bodies um, and showing their joy that like, these are people who have partners and who are in loving relationships and they get to be sexy if they want, you know, they get to have sexy times if they want. And that is fine. And that is a thing we can celebrate um, regardless of what size they are. Um, so yeah, I, I highly encourage folks to check out the Add a Positivity Project um, because I, I that is that is one example kind of of an activist kind of fighting against anti-fat bias, particularly around sex and sexuality. And it's it's just so cool. Yeah. Substantia is just is just phenomenal. She is herself a fat photographer. I don't I didn't have her picture up here, but she is also a fat femme photographer um, who's doing this work. That's super cool. So again, when we think about sort of who do we want to date, who do we want to hook up with, we get to have our own individual boundaries and preferences. Um, because we have our own autonomy and we, you know, we want to respect that. But again, we, we are surrounded by a culture that supports anti-fat bias. And so again, it's just taking the time to kind of investigate, you know, where are, where are your boundaries and preferences coming from? It's not to say you can't have them. It's just like, Hey, be informed, like be aware of where, what may be influencing your boundaries and preferences. And are there things you might, you might want to do differently. So anti-fat bias looks a lot of ways. If we're looking at sort of an individual's internal biases, we can think about, you know, dating preferences, you know, your choice to tell fat jokes or not. Um, concern trolling is unfortunately a thing a lot of fat people have to deal with. So concern trolling is basically the idea that a friend or family member comes to you, a fat person, and says, hey, I'm worried about your health. And, and while it is absolutely true to be worried about anybody's health that you care about, um, the fact is that for a lot of fat people, this is already something they have to deal with. Basically, you have to deal with a lot of shit as a fat person. And honestly, someone's health is it's, it's their business and maybe their doctor's business, and that's it. Um, it isn't anybody else's business. So being aware, is that a thing, you know? That is certainly a thing that has happened in my family um, and that I personally am trying to get better about. Um, bigger systems of oppression, right? The, the, our emphasis on sort of thinness means that the diet industry, the fitness industry, those are huge. Those are huge, huge industries. And companies have a vested interest in making us find problems with our bodies that we need to fix, that we need to particularly pay money for their product, their class, their whatever, in order to fix. Um, and so we're in a system that incentivizes people to feel shitty about their bodies, kind of for whatever reason, but size is a big one that, that often comes up. Um, and then of, of course, there's just blatant discrimination, right? Um, that weight is not a protected class the way race or gender are. And I'm, yeah, and that's unfortunate and that can be really difficult. Okay, okay, dead stuff. Thank you for sticking with me. Yes, Rachel, I can see your hand. You said you couldn't see if people raise their hands, so I thought. Yes, that actually works. If you if you turn on your camera and put it on, then I can totally see it. Thank you, thank you. I have two things. Going back one topic. Yep. If, if you are receiving disability benefits based on your own work record, they do not disappear if you get married. That's if it was based on your spouse's work, work oh, record. Okay, that's so, good to know. You know. I have SSDI. If I get married, I still receive it um, because I put it into the system. Um, but the 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 fat thing, uh, you know, clearly I, I'm fat. I'm not using that as a judgment. It's the reality. Um, the I wouldn't, and this is personal. I wouldn't mind it if someone came up and said. I'm worried about your health. Not, not a stranger. What bothers me is, you know what diet worked for me? Or the other one is, and my sister-in-law does this all the time. Oh, you look great. Have you lost weight? Like, did I look like shit before? And so this last time I actually said, no, I actually have gained weight. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. it, those are the things like you think you're complimenting someone, but you're actually making a judgment. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to write that down. Thank you. 
I have run into, so I have a chronic illness. I have fibromyalgia and I definitely get the unsolicited, have you tried this? And it's like, you know, on the one hand, I know you're trying to be thoughtful. On the other hand, like, could you just, could you just not? right? Like it's your own business. Like it's your own business. Oh yeah. Thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate your sharing your perspective. Thank you. That's awesome. So yeah, be careful. Be careful about what you were saying when you're trying to compliment someone. Yes. Awesome. Elaine. Um, two things. I am reminded of the scene in, um, Oh, what was the movie with Olympia Dukakis, The Seven Women in the Small Town? Steel Magnolias. Steel Magnolias, thank you. Where she says she's training her new protege, um, Dolly Parton is training her new protege, and she says, there's no such thing as natural beauty, <laughs> which, <laughs> which means that everyone is just ugly and they need to be fixed up which how terrible is that mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and then the other thing i wanted to comment on is that um i um i have friends who of course have illnesses but i will find something in the news like something very recent and forward it to them to say Hey, did you know about this? And they actually had not, and and then wanted to look into it. But it's not because, you know, I'm trying to shame them or yeah. or anything. I'm like, hey, here's this really new thing that maybe you haven't seen about yet. Yeah, and that that kind of makes sense, right? Exactly. Like, it's it's some of it's kind of contextual, and it's also dependent on the person, right? Some people may be more open to receiving this kind of information than others. And if you have a longer, you know, a longer relationship with a person, like you kind of get to know, like, is this a thing they appreciate or a thing they don't really seem to like enjoy? But yeah, no, I know that's true. A lot of you know, it's like the have you tried yoga, like. <laughs> Uh, you know, as opposed to like, hey, there was a new study that came out, like there was a study that just came out that suggests that maybe fibromyalgia may be an autoimmune condition. Um, and it's like that like just came out. So yeah, like people were sharing that and like, that was actually really interesting. Uh, so we have a comment in the chat. Can you oh, see Oh, great. That? Let me see if I can. Hey, I found the chat. Do you have the comment though? Yeah, I think I see it. Yes. Yes. So Miriam says, yes, I have MS and find it insulting and demeaning to my illness and experience when people say they know how I feel or suggest I try something. I try not to take it in a negative way, but even if they have MS, they don't quite understand my flavor of MS. Yeah, Miriam. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I totally, I totally hear you. Like, yeah. Um, I feel like, I feel like, you know, cause the thing is bodies are so individual that yeah, like somebody's not going to have your flavor of MS. Somebody's not going to have my flavor of fibromyalgia. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. I see you. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, you know, making sure doing what we can to make sure everybody that, that we're aware of these biases that we're kind of, but we're working on fighting them and yeah, that we're, we're just trying to get everybody access to good, um, good sex ed, good healthcare. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. All right. So yay. Thanks everybody. Thanks to that. I found the chat panel. So yes, now, now if you do want to ask things in chat, I think I can see it. I don't, I still, I'm not, I still cannot guarantee the hand raising, but I can at least, I now have the chat window up. So that's, that's good. Sorry y'all. Zoom, zoom interfaces is still a little weird to me. I'm figuring it out. All right, let's move on. Okay. Let's look at racism. Okay. Acknowledgement. I'm a white person. I'm going to share some of the things I've learned. I'm not an expert on this since I do not have personal experience. Um, and this is going to be fairly brief because like uh, racism is just such a huge and pervasive issue. I'm going to try to carve off a very small piece that we can look at. So again, when we think about who looks sexy, who is entitled to pleasure, people of color do not necessarily make the list. And if they do, it can often be in a fetishizing way, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there's also, and this is actually also related to class, who has the time and the resources, both physical and mental, to enjoy physical pleasure? 
um, you know, it's that's often correlated with like what what class you are, and that may also be correlated with what race you are. Um, people of color, you know, if you're working a job that pays less, you're working more hours, it's going to be harder to to actually take that time for pleasure. Um, I recently read this awesome book called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together by Heather McGee. It just came out in February of this year. This is now the, if you want to read one book on structural racism, this is now the book I am recommending. Um, Heather takes a very good and comprehensive look kind of across time at sort of how past, you know, past racist decisions have hurt not just people of color, but have hurt white people too. Um, so I highly recommend this book. Um, just sort of in general, sort of better understanding of structural racism and kind of the 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 water we are swimming in. Um, so in particular, so Afrosexology is an effort, Afrosexology.com is run by two Black women activists out of St. Louis, Missouri, Delisha and Rafaela. They're also a former Effing Foundation grantee. And what they say is the white supremacy system in place throughout the diaspora is designed to alienate, control, and destroy Black bodies. Reclaiming our Black bodies and sexuality is in direct opposition to the system and an act of resistance. So there is an active movement among activists of color to recognize the importance of visual, physical pleasure and in being able to reclaim one's body and sexuality as a person of color. Super cool. Um, so when we think about kind of sexual racism, like what does racism look like kind of in a, in a context around, around sex, what we're often dealing with is different kinds of racist stereotypes. So we've got exclusion where you may have a dating profile that says, well, no Asians, no Hispanics, no fats, no femmes, um, common, unfortunately common to see on cisgender gay men's profiles. Um, but you can have this sort of exclusion where you've got these kind of stereotypes about what people are like. And so you've decided that you just do not want to date them. Um, on the other hand, we also have to deal with fetish fetishization, right? So being obsessed with people of a particular race is exotic. Um, you know, you run into these kind of stereotypes for kind of the, the Asian woman seductress stereotype or the oversexed black man stereotype. Um, and so... And these are all things that, that again, we sort of carry that, that are in the water around us as in the kind of white supremacist system that we live in. And I will, I will point out that sexuality and sexual pleasure can, can be particularly challenging, say, for Black women, because we come from a huge history of white people who owned slaves raping those slaves as a source of free labor. Um, like that's just, that is, that is just awful and deep and complicated and trauma that like dates back like generations at this point. So these are some of the things that we have to keep in mind. So again, do we get to have individual boundaries and preferences around sort of who we date or who we think is attractive? Sure. But it is really important to every so often take a step back and interrogate those and, and consider, you know, am I, am I, am I, am I actually holding on to some kind of racist preferences, whether it's exclusion or fetish, fetishizing people? So when we look at racism under the kind of, under this lens for internal biases, and again, this is this is very specific around kind of sex and dating. Like we're looking at people's dating preferences. Again, do we need to re-examine those? Um, our larger systems of oppression, right? Again, we live in a white supremacist society. People do not all have equal access to resources. Despite the fact that America, we like to tell ourselves that it's like we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. There are folks who are starting the race much farther back. Um, because of unequal access to resources that have, that have been going on for generations. So yeah, The Sum of Us is a great book um, for looking at that, that kind of picture. Um, okay, let's take a question break. Check in, how folks, how folks doing? I'm thinking we've been at this for about an hour. So I would say let's, if people want, let's take a five minute, Elaine, is that okay? Can I offer people like a five minute break to like use the restroom or whatever? Sure. Yeah, so I'd say right now, if you wanna take a bio break, take care of your body, 
get something to drink. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I get something to drink. The last time I gave a talk, I forget to have water. And that was, that was a horrible decision, my friends. So yeah, I'm going to take a quick bio break. I will see you back here probably in like three minutes or something. We can check in and make sure everybody's good to go. But yeah, like we've been through a lot of material and we've still got, we've got some challenging stuff to come. So yeah, yeah feel free to take a pause. So I will be back in a couple of minutes and we can go from there. Let me, yeah. Yay. All right. Yay. Thank you all for that, for indulging me in, in that. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> How we doing? How we doing? Folks about ready to, to dive back in? Yep. Yep. Getting some thumbs up, getting some nods. Awesome. All right. So, I'm like, oh man, I've got water in my voice. It's like my voice is already starting to go a little bit. So we'll see, we'll see how this does. All right. All right. So let's get back into it. So the last topic that we're going to touch on is sex work. Sex work is a very contentious area, like within feminist activism. And so I am going to share with you my perspective, like as, as a sex positive activist, what what, how, how I tend to think about sex work. And you, you may not agree with me and that is okay. We can disagree. I appreciate that. I appreciate your willingness to listen. And yeah, we're going to have, we're going to have plenty of time for questions. So this can absolutely be a, be the start of a conversation. So what is sex work? So the first thing I want to point out is that in talking about sex work, we, sex workers specifically have said don't use the term prostitute or prostitution. 
um, sex work activists have been very clear that they that that they want to be called sex workers and what they do is sex work. So when I this kind of way back at the beginning when I talk about I believe people when they tell me what their experience is, this is one of those things. Um, sex workers have very clearly said, "Hey, call us sex workers. Call what we do sex work." So that's why I'm using this this particular term. What is sex work? At a very basic level, it's essentially the consensual exchange of sex for anything of value. Can be money, can be lodging, can be food, um, you know, can be a couch to crash on. And that is basically illegal in most places in the United States most of the time. Um, so you'll note that this, that I'm very clearly saying this is the consensual exchange because what I am not talking about is what we call human trafficking. That is where people are coerced into labor, whether it's sexual or otherwise. So when we're doing this kind of activism, we're gonna make a distinction between, when we say sex work, we do mean consensual, which means it's got it like everybody is adult for one thing, um, and everybody is consenting to the exchange of sex for this thing of value. We are not talking about human trafficking. We're not talking about underage people. We're not talking about people who are forced into um, exchanging, you know, performing sex acts on people. That is that is bad and wrong and awful. <laughs> like, I absolutely, like, I'm not, you know, of course, right? So, but the, so what we are talking about is the consensual case where we have adults consenting to this exchange. So I just I want to kind of set the boundary there because um, that that is what we are what I'm talking about right now. And we are like human trafficking is awful, awful. Any kind of coerced slave labor, whether it's it's for sex or, you know, you're working in in deveining shrimp in Thailand or like whatever, whatever. Not OK just not okay. Nobody is arguing in favor of human trafficking. Nobody. Um, what we're talking about is sex work. So if we're th considering this consensual exchange of sex for something of value, there are lots of different ways that that can look. So you might, you might be a stripper or an erotic dancer. You might be performing in pornography. You might be a cammer. So you may have heard of a cam girl. This is someone who basically is performing sex acts on camera for a, an audience through the internet. So, um, it may or may not, it may or may not involve any other people besides just the person who's camming. Um, but that's, you know, that's one profession. Um, pro dom. So people who may do work around BDSM or kind of physical, like those kind of physical acts. You've got escorting. Um, you've got sugar babying, right? So you can, there's actually, and I, I forget what it's called off the top of my head. I think Seeking Arrangements is the website, but you can have a young person basically go like a college student and be like, okay, I'm going to become this person's living girlfriend or boyfriend. And they're going to provide, you know, shelter or food or whatever, right? Sugar baby, sugar baby, sugar daddy. That is a thing. And it, it's, it happens, right? Um, and so the thing to consider, so there's a whole sort of range of what we might think about as sex work. They vary in terms of what acts people will perform. Like any anybody in any of these professions will have their own boundaries, right? You can do an escort and do penis and vagina, like full service work or not. Um, you know, you can be a porn performer and there are only certain things you want to do or certain people you want to work with. So they vary in sort of what acts people are doing. And depending on the situation, people may or may not actually identify as sex workers, right? And that's that's okay. Um, like, this is, this is one of those things where I'm kind of talking about sex work from the perspective of kind of the groups of sex workers who have started to organize and how they are talking. Um, but I'm not going to make an assumption about any individual person in any of these professions, whether or not they identify as a sex worker or not. That's a very personal thing. Um, and so we just kind of have to be careful. So it's it, it, like, like everything, like everything. <laughs> Thinking about identity is complicated and messy. Um, so again, I recognize we're kind of talking in generalities. And once you're working with a, you know, you're talking to a specific person, depending on what they do, they may or may not identify as a sex worker. The main thing that you will hear sex workers say over and over and over again is sex work is work. And so the question is, what does that, what does that mean, right? What does it mean if we say sex work is work? 
part of it is we recognize that like any other job, people have different reasons. People have different reasons for doing sex work, just the same way that people have different reasons for deciding to become a programmer at Google or why are they, why are you working this particular fast food job, right? For some sex workers, it's a, it's survival, um, especially for queer and trans people, especially queer and trans people of color, where they are often discriminated against in, in not outside of sex work. Sex work is a job that they can do. You don't need any special education. Like you've got your body, you can decide what you're going to do with it. Right. So for some, it's like, this is just how I make money. Like, you know, you may go to, you may go to your job at Google and, and for some folks, it's like, this is just how I make money. Like I make good money. So this is what I do. Other folks who are sex workers really like the profession. They genuinely enjoy it. Um, I'm not going to say this is all sex workers, right? Everything is very individual. So you might have a programmer who works at Google who is like, yeah, I think Google is really cool. I like their values. Like I like working there. And that may for, maybe for them, it's a big part of their identity is being a Googler as what they call themselves. Um, so there's this whole spectrum, right? Just like any job, people have different reasons why they do sex work. Um, and similarly, you know, people have different relationships to the work that they do, right? For some people, doing sex work is really, it is just a thing to put food on the table for them and their kids. You know, they need, they're disabled, they need flexible hours. This is the thing they can do that they know will put food on the table. Whereas for other folks, it's very, maybe it's an identity thing and they really enjoy the relationships they build with clients and they really enjoy uh, they may enjoy the physical aspects of the work, like, or they may not, right? Again, this is a huge spectrum and people fall all over the place. And regardless of where, where they fall, like why they're doing sex work or how they think about what they think about the sex work that they're doing, it's still, it's still work. It's still a job. And so sex workers are basically seeking the same rights and protections that other workers have. Um, that is what sex worker activism is generally about. Um, and so if we are embracing a, 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 a policy of respecting bodily autonomy and respecting consent, then, you know, then for me, that means I support sex workers, right? Um, SWAP USA, so the Sex Worker Outreach product, Project, that SWAP has chapters all over the world. Um, and, you know, SWAP USA, their slogan right now is rights, not rescue, right? And so what sex workers are asking is just for sex work to be recognized as work and for them to have the same rights that other workers have. So generally what sex workers are asking for is decriminalization. So let's figure out what that is. Basically they're asking legislatures to rep repeal or amend the statutes that make sex work a criminal offense. So it's, it's basically just saying that if you exchange sex for something of non, like something of value that the law basically has no comment, right? Um, there is a difference between decriminalization and legalization, right? Legalization generally involves additional laws that put specifications on and restrict, you know, and regulate how sex work works. This is what you have in like the Netherlands, for instance, where, uh, or even in Nevada, right? Where, well, you can do sex work, but you have to be on a brothel. Like there's all these, there's like certain requirements that you have to meet. Generally, sex workers are arguing for decriminalization because unfortunately, legalization where it is licensed and regulated still tends to, still tends to harm sex workers. They often then still are not able to work the way that they want to, um, you know, are you are you forced to work at a brothel, basically, where a cut of your money is going to the organization that owns the brothel, things like that. So generally, sex workers are pushing for decriminalization. And the question is like, well, why? <laughs> why are sex workers asking us for this? And there's a few reasons. Um, and I'm, I'm, the, this list is from an article called Sex Work is Real Work and It's Time to Treat It That Way um, from the ACLU site. And I link, I link to this on my website. So why? Um, first of all, sex workers currently are exposed to a lot of police violence. Police officers will basically have sex with a sex worker and then arrest that person. Um, they will, you know, you will, 
there are stories of sex workers being taken into custody and raped by police. Um, the fact that sex workers have to interact with police at all is basically horrible for the sex workers. And so if sex work is not a crime, if it is just something two people agree to do, the police have no business in it. Um, and that's great. It's also great because if sex work is not a crime, and for instance, you have been, say, kidnapped and forced into it, you can go to the police without being afraid that you're going to be punished for being a sex worker or punished for having been forced into sexual work, to clarify. So it helps actually make everybody safer because if the sex work is no longer a crime, then we can prosecute people who are doing actual crimes. Um, which is cool. It also makes sex workers less vulnerable to violence from clients because, you know, right now, if a client is going to do something nasty to a sex worker, the sex worker has no recourse. You can't go to the police because, you know, what you were doing was illegal to begin with and you risk additional violence at the hands of the police. So, it actually gives sex workers more power when it comes to their clients. Um, also, just for their health, right now in certain places, just carrying a condom can be can be used as evidence of sex work, regardless of whether or not you were actually engaging in any kind of sex work. It can be dangerous in some places for people to carry condoms. That is ludicrous, like for a number of reasons. That is ludicrous. Um, but once sex, you know, we once sex work is decriminalized, sex workers can. Uh, you know, can carry any supplies that they need. They can use condoms. They can can set the boundaries that they want to set. Um, and so it, this will be better for sex workers in terms of their health and their clients' health. Um, this is also an issue of LGBTQ plus equality, right? Unfortunately, at like a large proportion of folks doing sex work are queer and or trans. Um, and again, part of this is because there is still such rampant discrimination against queer and trans people, especially queer and trans people of color. And so recognizing this um, and decriminalizing this is a huge step um, to help our queer, queer and trans siblings of color um, that were currently doing sex work. This also helps to reduce mass incarceration, right? You have people in jail for engaging in consensual sex, um, which is ludicrous. And it, unfortunately, it is not uncommon if 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 a if a if a police officer arrests a sex worker, they are often charged with trafficking themselves. Like that is what that is what trafficking laws right now look like. Um, it's it's ridiculous. So when we have people who are consensually engaging in sex, regardless of whether something is for if value is exchanged, we can just let that we can just let that go. We can get people out of prison. We can keep people out of prison, um, which is a good thing. So when we're thinking about sex work, we have to consult our internal biases. And there are, are unfortunately a lot of bias against sex workers. Um, you know, this, uh, unfortunately, you know, you can make jokes about sex workers, about the harm that comes to sex workers, and there's often not much in the way of repercussion. Um, you know, sex workers being seen as morally depraved people or, you know, who will have sex with anybody for any reason. Um, it's tough. Um, I'll, you know, this recognizing sex workers as human, again, especially, um, you know, women, especially queer and or trans folks, like, so important. I'm just like, let's just, let's just do that. Um, it's tough. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, come on. Um, and then again, the system of oppression is very obvious in this case because it is criminalized. Um, and so you have a whole, a whole industry practically of people working against um, consensual sex work. And it's just, it's just tough. It's tough. Um, things like FOSTA-SESTA, which is the leg legislation that was pushed through, um, it's been several years at this point that shut down sites that sex workers were using to advertise and screen clients. Well, that that has pushed more sex workers out onto corners. Um, whereas, if sex work is not a crime, you know, sex workers can have places where they can advertise, where they can screen clients for each other. You know, sex workers can be safer. 
and the just it's it's I mean it's it's a human rights issue um you know Amnesty International the World Health Organization are just some of the the organizations that have are now standing in support of decriminalizing sex work and so if we if we look at this collection of things together I want to point out that queer trans disabled fat sex working parents exist right none of these identities that we've talked about exists alone that they often are combined and so you have folks who are multiply marginalized who have to deal not only oh yeah sex working parents of color um you know so like these people exist and they are having to deal with internal biases and systems of oppression of all of these things like at the same time. Um, and that's something that I didn't really fully appreciate until I started getting into sex positivity activism. You know, it touches so many aspects of life and there are so many of these systems, you know, I'm, I'm queer, trans and disabled. I have friends who are, you know, queer and trans sex workers, um, like, or sex workers of color, like, or trans, black, black trans sex workers, right? Like, all of these people actually exist. Um, and so ideally, when you're doing this work, you want to try and center the folks who have multiple marginalizations. Um, and that's one of the things we try to do at the Effing Foundation when we award grants, you know, we, we have a number of demographic goals, like in, in these categories, like specifically, right? So, you know, at least 60% of our dollars go to projects that are led by all people of color. At least 30% of our dollars go to projects who are led by all trans people. Um, you know, and we've got, we're, we're striving to get representation as well for disabled people, for fat people, for sex workers. Um, this year, we've got a new goal. We're going to try and fund work by formerly, currently or formerly incarcerated people. Um, you know, that's, that's what we're kind of striving for as we sort of, you know, inspect our own internal biases and we try to fight these systems of oppression is recognizing that this overlap absolutely exists and how, how are we trying to center those people in our conversations? So when we look at sex positivity, right, and we think about accepting people's desires and choices around consensual sex, we've got this foundation of bodily autonomy and consent. Like those are some of the key values that are driving our sex positivity. And as a result, it forces us to re-examine and, and struggle with our internal biases and also to look at other systems of oppression and how we can, we can fight those as well. So I'm almost done and then we'll get back to questions. Um, I just wanna give a shout out to my husband and my friends who have been super supportive for me in this work and, and taking care of me as I've written this slide presentation. Um, the board, the advisory council, staff and supporters of the Effing Foundation. Um, I am so thankful to work with such an amazing community of people. Um, and I wanna give thanks, thanks so much to you, the women of Red F Shalom and specifically to Elaine for inviting me to be here. It really is an honor to have this opportunity to really dive into these tough issues with you. And I, I really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you all for sticking with me. Like I say, this is a lot of big stuff. It's a lot of tough stuff. Um, and I really, really appreciate it. So yeah, um, as a reminder, so and I will put this in the chat because I now can see the chat. So if you go to toymaker, HTTPS, da, 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 toymakerproject.com, the top post on the blog right now is the slides for this talk and links to the organizations and articles that I've referenced. And so that is all there for you. Um, and now we are here and open for more questions. You're welcome to, uh, to now I can see chat. So you're welcome to message chat. You're welcome to use the anonymous form. Um, you're welcome to, to raise a hand or speak up on video. I think everything is now available, but thank you all again so much for having me. Um, and, and for all that you have shared so far with your questions and, and comments and contributions to the discussion, uh, it's been really great getting to hang out with you. Oh, thank you. 
so yeah, I am going to, I'm going to paste tiny, the URL for questions in the chat. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that I can actually see everybody. So Yay. All right. So, okay. So I see we have two people with hands up. We're going to go to Rachel and then Jocelyn. Um, I have, I, I'm equally sensitive to what people, you know, that people's truth is their truth. And I accept that. Um, I guess there's, if you're a cashier and you don't want to be called a cashier, then what are you? And so I guess this whole thing about sex workers is this, you know, I don't want to be called that, but that's what you do. And I'm not, like I said, I accept people's truth, but if we are tiptoeing around that, then we're also participating in this sex is shameful and sex work is shameful. And so that's where it's like, if this is what you do, and this is a legitimate job, and I know right now it's not, but then that's what you do. And me calling it like, okay, you're a florist. Like you're, you're not a florist. And so I guess there's this tug between sex positivity and being so cautious about what you say about sex workers. Mm. It, 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 I hear, you know, that's, I hear you. I mean, that's, yeah. And I think, I guess the question is, and I, I should do some more look into sort of how did this movement go away from prostitution to sex work. My under my my limited understanding that I have is that sex workers wanted to make it clear, very clear what they do, sex and work. They're going to put it right out there. This is our job. Like I do I do I use sex, it is my job, it is work. So in that sense, I feel it's actually being a little more clear. Um but but yeah, I mean I I can see that. I can see that, you know, and for me, it's just like, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? Because it's, it's like, yeah, if, if, if for some, if there were some movement of cashiers that were like, we don't want to be called cashiers anymore. We want to be called something else. I guess I would try and listen. Um, but as a, as an individual case by case basis, yeah, I can see how that, how that gets tricky, but yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. Jocelyn, did you have a comment or question? Yes. Well, first I'd, I'd like to address too that our language evolves over time. I mean, it just, it does. It's no longer acceptable to call people of color, colored people. It's no longer acceptable to, I mean, there, you know, you don't call sanitation workers garbage men. It's kind of demeaning. I mean, and it goes on and on and on and on. So, you know, our, our language evolves with time and at, uh, as a, a population, it, you know, generally you go with the consensus of the people who are in, in the, the profession that they're in and what they prefer to be called or, um, or you know, like any type of thing really, um, you know, what it's, it's kind of, to me, it's almost the same as, um, you know, pronouns, you know? Um, so I wanted, I wanted to bring that up. And the other thing I wanted to bring up was um, ethics with regard to, um, to sex positivity, because, you know, we talked about, pre you talked about preferences and, and, you know, there's a difference. There's, there's a line between bias and fetishism and, you know, and yeah. things like that. So I, I think it's very important to touch on, you know, ethics. There are people, there are people who can have, you know, freedom in their sexuality and, and, and joy sexuality and, um, but that doesn't mean they want to be treated poorly afterwards, disregarded, objectified, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I, you know, I think, I think it's yeah. very important to put ourselves in other people's shoes for lack of a, a better yeah. term. Um, and, you know, and how, how would we want to be treated as individuals and just trying to gain the perspective 
of each individual, especially if you are being intimate with them. That's very important. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jocelyn. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. No, I appreciate both of those. And I think very much there is the yeah, and I think I think I think you're absolutely right that sort of ethics and like how are we really treating people is is yeah so important for for so many of these issues. Yeah, and again, especially as you say, if you're going to be intimate with someone, like yeah, right. We want we want ourselves like we want ourselves to be respectful, mindful people. We want to raise our youth so they will be respectful and mindful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, sure, Rachel. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just chatty. I just want to be clear that it wasn't about what people preferred to be called. I'm cool with that because all that has changed. And you know, I'm I'm queer. I do not like the term lesbian. I go by gay. So that's you know, that's something I understand. It wasn't that. It's more the tiptoeing around it that we're doing that is is saying, well, then that's is that positive? Like you know, if we were talking again about a group of cashiers, you know, hey, I know some cashier. Now, there are some cashiers who don't want to be called cashiers. So you have to be really sensitive to that. We wouldn't do that with any other profession. So until you know what someone prefers to be identify as, that extra caution is part of that. This isn't OK. And I'm I'm making this more you know, to say, well, some people don't, but, you know, always ask people what they prefer to be called. But this yeah. assumption that, you know, it, it's like, well, make sure you ask people their pronouns. Is it, I appreciate that. And particularly in a conference or something, but the first time I meet someone, I'm not going to be, so what are your pronouns? Like that's, that to me is a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's, it's more about how cautious we are. If we're positive about it and we believe it's all okay, then we shouldn't be tiptoeing around it. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, how do we, how, what are we doing in terms of self-censorship? And yeah, no, that's totally legit, totally legit concern. Yeah. I, yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Other folks have, have questions? Comments? Yeah, we're doing all right. We're doing all right on time. Yay. Thank you all again so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Kit. Thank you very much for putting this together for us. And um, you're welcome. Yeah, we hope that uh, lots of people get to see this now on our YouTube channel. Yes. Yes. Yeah, when Elaine puts out the link, like, please, please send that along to other folks who you think might be interested. Absolutely. Okay. Well, if no one has any other questions, then we will say good night and uh, we get to sleep on all this and internalize it and come out better people. Yay. Yay. Thank you all again. It's been awesome. Thank you, Elaine.